Want to have your very own free-range egg farming business? Welcome to Green Grass Egg Farming Podcast with Daniel O'Brien, the show dedicated to giving you the latest tips, ideas and interviews to help you produce the best tasting free-range eggs and sell your eggs for the highest price. And here's your host, Daniel O'Brien. Daniel O'Brien here. Welcome back to Greengrass Egg Farming. My special guest today is Roger Shannon from Carbine Pastured Produce. How are you today, Roger? Great, thanks, Daniel. Uh, excellent. Today, we're going to be talking about principles of cell grazing. Roger's got a farm with sheep, with cattle, with egg-laying chickens, and with meat chickens, and cell grazing is something you've done for a while, Roger. And from my opinion, it's something you do quite well. I think some people sort of touch on cell grazing and they do a bit of it. But from my opinion, you live it. You do this sort of every day and you understand some of the, the fundamentals. So that's why I've called this podcast Principles of Cell Grazing. So do you want to start, Roger, just by telling us what is cell grazing so for someone they've just bought a farm or they're about to visit a farm what is cell grazing cell grazing is the the, the mobbing up of, of of ruminant animals so what we're doing is we're basically mimicking what would happen naturally in nature by by putting these ruminant animals which are herbivores so in the wild, they would be the buffalo, the bison, the wildebeest, you know, all those ruminant animals that, that eat grass and, and walk across the, the, the grass plains of whatever country we're talking about. Now, following those herbivores and keeping those herbivores tightly bunched is predator animals. So your lions, your... your your leopards, your whatever, are keeping those herbivores all bunched in together for protection. And what this actually does is gets those animals moving across that land in a in a in a pace, so they they're eating this grass on the on the savanna lands. They're eating it once, trampling it into the ground, urinating on it, and putting their manure on it, and moving on. They're not hanging on this grass and, and taking a munch here today and then coming back tomorrow and going, oh, I'll have this bit of grass tomorrow. They're moving very quickly across the landscape and not coming back for a long period of time, in which time that plant gets to recover. So what we're doing in an agricultural sense is using animals that we use in agriculture to eat our grass, so our ruminant animals, our sheep and our cattle, and we're, we're doing the same thing. We're bunching them up. We're making them. We're, we're making them eat that grass quickly and moving them on, so that grass can recover. We've put the fer fertility back in the soil through their urine, through their dung, and through that trampled grass. We then allow all the, the soil microbes and bugs to to create to use all that fer fertility, put it back into the soil. In plant available form, the plant takes it up, recovers, grows up to its maximum height that we allow it to, and then we bring the stock back in. So that's that's pretty much the principles of cell grazing. We we replace the predator with an electric fence. Okay, so you you don't have lions running around your farm chasing your cattle. <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, no. So you use electric fences to keep them moving. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So on the flip side, let's just say whether on a farm or whether in Africa, you took those predators, animals away, or in your case, took the electric fence away, and let's just let the, the cattle and sheep just walk over the whole farm, go where they want, when they want. What's going to be the difference for the animal, for, for the land, for the whole sort of environment? So what we're immediately going to have is we're going to have those animals are going to be very selective in what they eat. So they're going to come in and they're, they're just going to be like humans, you know. If, if we have a choice every day, we're going to go to the ice cream and, and take out the ice cream before we go for the salad, before we go for the, you know, for the, for the leafy greens. Yeah. 
So, I mean, that's great to be able to get a little bit of ice cream every now and then, but if we're constantly going back and picking ice cream, it's no good for the health of the animal. It's no good for that plant because that animal is going to keep coming back to that ice cream plant because it is the most palatable and go, yep, I love that one, I love that one. And you're not allowed, going to allow that plant to recover and rejuvenate itself. So you're actually going to end up killing that plant. Yeah. And the plants that are less palatable for that animal are going to take over that spot. So we're actually going down in our order of succession. So the order of succession starts off with annual grasses and annual weeds and then builds all the way up to wood to woody plants to to trees yeah so what we're trying to do as graziers is keep our order of succession around a perennial grass that is our optimum for performance in terms of dry matter production and animal performance so the more that we graze an individual plant and allow that animal to we're knocking back back down the succession order and we're going to annuals and and weeds yes okay so with a real life example what it it could be is going out to the backyard and you've got a lemon tree and um every day pruning that lemon tree until it's a stump and as you said it dies because it doesn't actually get any chance to recover because you're just pruning it every single day rather than prune it and then come back after a year after it's full of lemons pick the lemons and prune it again maybe yeah probably a greater example would be if you walked across one one section of lawn every day yeah you you never need to mow that lawn because you've you've made a bare patch you you've taken that order of succession all the way back down to bare dirt and what's yep. going to grow there if you don't walk on it for a week you're going to see weeds start to emerge in that bare patch yes whereas around you where you've where you've rested it enough if you've got nice lawn that you can mow you know once a week once depending on the time of year yes yeah okay so but by putting all the all the cattle together moving them quickly they're going to eat everything because that they'll come into a paddock that they eat the so-called ice cream plant that was yummy but then they don't really have any choice they they got to eat everything else there because yeah they they're there for a very quick time so what we're doing is where the animal just comes in and goes it'll have actually it's quite interesting to actually when you put them into the paddock to see what they do they will come across and the first thing they'll do is they'll they'll walk right across their paddock and munch on what they want to first yeah they'll go yep this is beautiful this is what i want and they'll be very selective on their first couple of mouthfuls once they've done a walk of that that paddock they'll then come through and go right we're hungry we're starting to go through what you know what else, what else is left in the paddock and then by the time that they're finished in that paddock they'll have evenly graze that paddock pretty much taking out whatever they they can that is edible yeah okay a lot of what is not edible will or will then be trampled and urinated and dunged on so we're creating a little fer- fertility patch on on that spot that wasn't palatable yeah that allows those more palatable species to to create an environment for, for them to germinate and grow from that spot yeah okay so on your farm, like as a real-life case study, you um, work the, the cattle and the chickens together, is that right? Yeah, so we take, um, we take the cattle in in big mobs. We're running at the moment um, 200 and, 260 heifers in a mob, two, 200 cows in a mob. Yep. Um, so we move them into an area for a day um, or, or two days uh, at the moment. Um, in summertime, when it's quite dry, we might take that out to three days, um, but we never take it more than three days. Because okay. if we take it more than three days, that that is where we start to, to lower that succession order and, and they'll take the more palatable, they'll take a second bite out of that most palatable species. Yes. Which is just sending up its new shoots, yep. which is what we don't want. We want them to be able to send up their new shoots as soon as they can to allow that, reco- that 
recovery re- rejuvenation period to be underway and and as quick as possible. Yeah. Um, so we move them, we move those cattle on, and then again, depending on what time of year it is, um, we will move our chickens in um, three days down to down to a, a single day in summertime because because of the heat and it has an effect of baking the the dung. Yep. Um, we find that we, we need to move those chickens in really quick to be able to allow them to, to get in the manure and spread it out and um, take all the parasites and, and bugs out of the, out of the dung. Yep. Um, and what, you know, what parasites they don't take out, they're just exposing the sunlight, which kills them off anyway. Okay. So, yeah, so the chickens move quite quickly, and that's... And doing it that way, we also then don't have to put up um, your um, poultry net fe- fences. Yep. Your feather nets, um, because the chickens are never used to where their surroundings. Yep. The only thing they are used to is their trailer. Yes. So they'll only roam a certain distance away from their trailer every day. The longer we leave it in a paddock, the further they will roam away from that. From that trailer yeah okay because they start to get a little bit adventurous and courageous and go oh i might just look over here today and yes you know, it's, i'm still not too far away from the trailer you know they get just get a little bit more adventurous in what they're doing the, the longer you leave them there and and doing that you know it makes them more susceptible to predators and it also means that well there might be a long piece of grass over there they might decide to go and build a nest over there Yes. Yep. So, so keep them moving. And, yep. and j- just so we give people a picture, like um, when you bring sort of two hundred head of of cattle in, what sort of area are those cattle in for one or two days? So it, it really depends on, on the amount of feed we have on offer. But um, in our situation at the moment, they're probably getting grazing. I'm grazing 260 heifers at the moment on one and a half hectares a day. Okay, yep. Yep, so, um, and when the, the chickens come in there, do, do you find those those chickens sort of cover that one and a half hectares quite well? Yeah, so I, I know that one trailer will cover one hectare in a, in a day. Yep. So on that, on that one and a half hectares, I would have, two to three trailers and that will well and truly cover that space yeah okay and 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 just so people know because because there's some people they may only be sort of on um um 20 or or 50 acres what's the sort of size of your farm that you um um that you're sort of grazing around before you're sort of coming back like your usable area that you're using here Yep, so we've got um, 549 hectares on our place, which is 1,400 acres. Yep. Um, and we're currently grazing in three mobs of cattle. Yep. And our rest period at the moment, we're just coming into spring, is is uh, 10 weeks at the moment, and that will probably be shortened down in the next sort of three weeks down to to 30 to 40 days yeah okay so so our aim is when our when our feed's growing fast is we want to move cattle fast and and get them across the country because we want to keep we want to keep our pasture in in the vegetative stage um for as long as we can yep um so so that's working on a sigmoid sigmoid growth curve Okay. Um, we want to take our plant from the from the from the top of the S back down to the bottom of the S. Yep. And then bring them back in when it gets back to the top of the S. So in in spring it goes very quickly up to the top of that S. Yes. So we're moving cattle very quickly. So we're probably leaving more vegetation on the ground and just going right. Just take the top off. Just take the top off. Just take the top off. And then. As the spring slows down, we can then slow our cattle down, and we can we can reduce that down um, and allow and allow our growth to to start waning. Yeah. 
as it, as it naturally does. So when when you bring the, the chickens in, that the, the cattle have all, already eaten it down. So the the chickens' role is to spread out the the cow pats. So um, they're not just in, in one big pile. They've spread that out. They're getting the, the the parasites and any bugs and beetles that are in there. They're they're also eating eating grass themselves and putting down nitrogen. The, the chickens themselves. So what have you found? in between mobs of cattle that you're not following with chickens and ones that you are? Can you see a noticeable difference? Yeah, you can, yeah. It, it's, the paddocks look a, a lot more patchy. Yep. And you get, you get an extra, you just get that extra boost by putting the chickens in. So you, you have that, that extra fertility that the chickens are bringing into the system and it's a different manure and it's just, it's just, you know, a different additive, and, and it's really, really noticeable the effect on the pasture. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, and the way that we do it, bringing those chickens in uh, straight after the cattle means that that grass that those chickens do eat is at a is at a height that is just perfect for the chicken. Yes. You know, they they love that just freshly emerged leaf that is the most palatable for them because they're. They're not a ruminant, so they can't, you know, they can't ferment the the long lignified grass yep. in their stomach. What they need is a short bit of grass that they can grind up in their in their stomach and use. Yeah, you know, they're very much an omnivore, so we can't expect them to go into a big paddock, you know, full of long grass and go, oh, look, this is beautiful for for chooks. Well, no. It's not really. Yeah, that's there right. May, there may be some bugs in there, but they're not going to touch that grass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in this mix, where where do your sheep sort of come in? Do they graze over the same area that your cattle and chickens have been? Yeah, through? they do. So so we'll we'll then bring our our sheep in after our after our chooks, um, depending on the time of year. So it's probably coming to about twenty one days. Okay, coming into spring. Yep. So that allows three weeks and, and, and a plant will put up three leaves in that stage. And at that stage, that is just what the sheep love. Yep. They love pasture that's not too high, not too short, and, and just nice and fresh. They, they love that fresh fresh grass. They don't, they don't like it rank and over their heads because yeah. that's when they, they're walking through a dewy or a wet pasture and getting it all over their wool and getting, you know, they just... They don't like that. They like it just at, a, at an in-between height, in-between yeah. where the chooks like it and where the cattle like it. Okay. So, so the sheep run through and then we give it a longer rest period before the, before the cattle come back. So how long uh, do you have, have the sheep in that area for? So what, we don't actually put the, the electric fences up for the sheep. Okay. When we first started, we were doing that yeah. and found that sheep just, you know, they constantly just look over the other side of the electric fence and go, oh, that pasture just looks fantastic and jump the fence. <laughs> okay. They don't like and don't handle being mobbed up as much as cattle do. Okay. So we found that running less sheep and running them quickly through through a larger paddock yep. works better for us. So that's why when we first started, we were running, we had 700 ewes on this place. And we've downsized that to about 200, and those 200 sheep will run through 20 to 30 hectare paddock in a week. Okay, yeah. So after they've been through, because it sounds like a, a, a quite a large area for that many ewes sort of in a week, can you see a lot of difference where they've been? Where the sheep have been? Yeah, like do they? T- I mean, do they take yeah, a lot of gr- grass off, or sheep, sheep can eat a lot of feed? Okay, but you know that that's why we don't run it at really high densities because yeah, it it would just make too much impact. Yeah, okay. So you want them to We'd ta- take have... the, those leaves off, but you don't want them to because it's only been three weeks earlier potentially that the chooks have been yeah. through. You just yep. want them to go through, grab the good feed, but yeah, keep, keep them moving fast. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then the the after the sheep have been through, now it, it depends from season to season. What are you sort of looking for before the, the cattle are sort of back in again? So we like to get get it up to the top of that 
sigmoid growth curve. So we're starting to see we're starting to see some stem elongation, some some um, seed head starting to emerge. Yep. That is the perfect time for a cow to come in and, and knock it down. Yep. Okay. We've had you know the perfect amount of growth on it, and you're putting the most amount of energy into that biomass for the for the cow to use. Okay. So basically, the main points are move your livestock quickly, but move them similar to the the rate of the growth of your pasture. So in in springtime, you've got a fast growth. You move your animals faster. In winter or or dry times, you're going to move them slower. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. Yeah. So uh, keep them close, like the cattle with electric fences. You'll have them in there one to two days, maybe three. The chickens come one to three days later. Again, that depends on season. So in summer, you're saying like... or like one day, would you have one like rest day, or is it the very next day? In in summertime, it tends to be the very next day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, we find yeah that the dung really bakes off quickly in in our heat here. Yeah. You know, if you if you're in a more more humid and overcast environment, you could probably keep that delay it for a day and, and just allow that that fresh shoot to come through. Yeah. For more benefit for the chook, but in our situation where we, we quite often have, have dry hot summers or dry hot periods anyway, that's when you want to, you just want to keep them moving really quickly behind the, behind the cattle. And in order to do that, you don't have to move every trailer every day. You can, you can use a leapfrog system. Okay. If you've got more, if you've got more than one trailer. So you might leave one one trailer in one spot for two days but then you leapfrog and you go directly behind the cattle for the next one yeah okay then, so you're only moving one trailer every day yeah yeah um, and, 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 just to cut and, down on your on your time you spend moving trailers around yeah okay so so the, the trailer it'll sit there for two days because like if you're using a two trailer technique and you're actually driving past the first one, and again the, the following day that second one is driving past the one in front to sort of catch up to the cattle. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. And and tell me quickly, you've got your your meat chickens. Tell me how you you, you sell graze them because I, I take it they're in enclosures where they've got access to the pasture, so you're moving them along. How do you do that? Yeah, so they're in movable hutches. So the hutches are three and a half by four metres with bottomless floors. So they get access to the pasture and they just get moved forward every day. And and what do you find? Because obviously they're, they're putting down a lot of manure in a small spot. What's the pasture like where they've been? It, it comes back very rich. You, when when you do it with your meat birds, you can't come back onto that spot for for another year at least. Okay. Just because of the nutrient load you put down. Yeah. So yeah, we we just run them over. We run them over our our areas on our place that that require the most amount of fertility. Yes. You know, probably the most degraded. Yep. Because yeah, they're they're a real fertility creators. Our, our meat birds. So we'll we'll move our our cattle or our sheep into an area and, and really knock that pasture down to get it down to a level that that is the right height for the chickens, and then and then move the chicks in and, and cover that area once in a year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how how many enclosures are, um, have you got for your meat chickens? We're just building up into our into our second production year this year, and we're going up to two hundred birds a week to be processed yeah so that will have five weeks on pasture that's a thousand birds on a thousand meat chicks on pasture at any one stage okay and you're running you're running roughly a hundred birds in in each hutch so ten ten hutches yeah okay and 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 those hutches they're only they're moving the um their length every day is that correct yeah just just their length every day yeah Yeah, so in the whole scheme of things you're certainly not going to cover your whole farm by 
having um, t 10 meat chicken hutches, but as you said, if you can focus on that land that needs it the most, you can sort of bring it up to speed quite fast. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. It depends on, on what you're trying to achieve on your place. I mean, that's what you really need to, to look at when, you, when you're going into these things, right? Is, you know, what am I trying to achieve in, in, with my animals? It, you know, it, it doesn't all come down to profitability. It's what we do on our place really starts off on an ecological base to start with. Yep. So it's, right, how does this animal perform? What, what, is it, what are its functions? So for, for a cow, it's really to turn, you know, carbonaceous material into, into meat and, and into, into fertility for the soil. Yeah. And, and the sheep's the same on a, on a sort of different, different scale. Yep. They just, you know, they don't have the size and their dung's not, not, you know, not a cow pie like, like the cows just have a nice little pie there that they leave for a chook. Yeah. Whereas sheep leave, leave, you know, they leave their dung everywhere. Yes. So that's that's why we say, like, the sheep, you know, they they, they don't poop in one spot. You know, they, they leave it, their poop everywhere. So it's good to have them behind the chooks. And and a lot of the parasites from the, from the sheep can be killed off just simply by sunlight because it's not in one big pile, which is great for for the parasites to stay in. Yes, okay. So with the meat chicks, we go, right, what do you actually perform? What, what is your function on this place going to be? Right, you're in a brood for three weeks, so you're, you're immediately you're, you're making compost for me. Yep. You then go out on the pasture, and what, what's your role on pasture? You know, apart from the fact that you're going to produce beautiful meat that has been raised on pasture, so it's got the great omega th three to six ratios, and it's full of all those extra nutrients that you don't get out of chickens in a shed. But well, what are chickens really good at? Eating, sleeping, pooping. Right. Yeah. So if I keep them on a small area for a day, I'm really going to be able to 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 manipulate the fertility in that spot. Yes. So, you know, th that's the kind of things you, you just need to think of when you start looking at these systems. It's, it's, it's looking at the animal and how it can perform for me. Yeah. Rather okay. than, right, I'm going to produce beef to make me the most amount of money. Yeah. And I think that's where we sort of get lost in agriculture at the moment. We just need to sort of take that step back and go, well, I've got to make this animal work for me, not not how do I push this animal to, to produce the amount, most amount of beef to, to make me the most amount of money because that system, that will come with it. You've just got to get your functions in place and work out how, how that animal functions on your place before you get there. Yeah. So, so typically in, in your area, like <clears throat> we're talking about like large acres, what are most people doing ar around your region? Like, I don't imagine they've all got sort of egg-laying chickens, meat chickens, sheep and cattle in a cell grazing, a, a, a one day, move them quickly. Typically, what, what let's just say, the traditional way um, in your area, how are they farming or what are they farming? So traditionally around here, it's, it, they're, we're traditional mixed farming areas, so a lot of sheep and, and cropping. Yep. Cattle, cattle also, but cattle really not on, on a, such a large scale around here. So crops around here, sort of wheat and canola in rotation, and then they probably put loosen in the rotation to put nitrogen back in the soil and give it pasture phase, and that's where, you, where your sheep come into it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's amazing the amount of people that comment on us having chooks on our place, and they think it's great, but, you know, they just don't get the principles behind it. Yes, yeah, yeah. That don't full, fully understand the big picture of like, why would you do that again? <laughs> yeah. So. And you know, we've just gone through through our wettest and most rainy day June we've ever had, and our lay rates just completely gone out the back door. We, yeah. We had twenty twenty days of rain. Okay. In the in the month where you have the shortest day, and the chooks just went, no thanks. Yeah. And when you're talking to people, it's amazing that people go. Yeah. Have you ever thought of just building a shed and putting them in there? And going, no, no, I haven't. <laughs> no, it hasn't crossed my mind. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and, and you can see back in the day, like we, we probably go back 100 years ago, uh, all egg-laying chickens, they would have been free-range or maybe it was a bit more than 100 years. And then over time, it was probably bright ideas like that will go, oh, hang on, the like re- a, a lot of wet weather sort of affects them a bit, so let's put them in, in a shed and let them run out the side. And then it's like, well, they're running out the side, they're still getting wet let's just keep them all closed oh now they're walking around their manure i know we could put a mesh floor underneath them and the manure all drops through and they go great idea so over time through innovation they created something amazing called caged egg farming but they sort of you need to sort of take a helicopter view zoom out it's like what have we created here yes it's it's great for you to have a good system so they're not walking around uh, in their feces, but go back to how you used to do it and the big picture. And it sounds like that's what you've done with your farm. You're like, what is this animal good at? How can it work with the next one, with the next one, with the next one? Opposed to let's just build a big shed and throw all the chooks in there. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I mean, this all really started back in around the Second World War is where, where industrial farming really took off because... What happened was there was a huge labour shortage and there was a huge demand for for all this product. Yeah. Because, you know, you had to feed people on the front line, had to feed people in the army, and all you had was was the, the women pretty much and the older men that were left at home to, to to make this. And they're going, well, what happens, you know, if if we do have this wet period and the chooks can't lay the eggs? And so, oh put them in the shed and blah, blah, blah. And that's how these things sort of steamroll. Yes. But immediately when you do that, you, you're not looking at the chicken as a chicken. You're looking at the chicken as a means of, of getting of getting food and that's it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little egg machine. Where should we put this little egg machine? Yep. Yeah. It's very much, you know, on the production line, chook. Yeah. You know, pumping those eggs out. and. You really need to take that step back and go, well, what's the point of having a chook if all it's doing is pumping out an egg? Yeah. You know, it was put on this earth with, you know, with claws and really good eyesight and a beak for, for a purpose. Yep. You know, and how can I utilise that to the best on my farm? So, you know, if we look at it that way, we start having more complementary systems in our farms and, and, not, and not just production models. Yeah, exactly. So if everything can work in together, the sum of all parts is greater than than the production of one. Yeah. And j- just to f- finish up, now that like the because you do sort of a cell grazing technique rather than just let all your animals just walk anywhere on the, on the farm, the carrying capacity, do you think it's increased now and you can now run more or less animals because of using this system? Oh, we definitely definitely run more. We are now at the stage, when we started, we, we that was four years ago we, we first moved here. We In the first year of our production, we ran 400 ewes, 200 steers, and 50 cows. Yep. Plus it was 50 hectares of crop. Yep. The crop was an almost failure in that year. Cropping went out went out after a year. Yep. Production now is we're, we're car- currently carving down 560 cows. Yep. We have 200 sheep on, 200 ewes that we lamb down twice a year. Yep. So... We'd, we'll we'll always have followers with those sheep. So if we'd say we're we're almost running at the same number of sheep that we had, just probably a little bit less because the lambs aren't quite at the size of of a grown ewe. Yep. And then we're also running, you know, fifteen hundred laying hens and, and a thousand meat birds on the ground at any one stage, and uh, and they do they do eat past us. So. Yeah. I'm not sure how to put that into a DSE basis, but yeah. <laughs> you know they they do add to the to the to to what eats pasture. So yeah, so so the point I'm if you look at it to... that way, we, we we are running a lot more stock than what we were. Yeah, exactly. And the point I'm, I'm putting across is when you do this right, 
you, you'll have a better farm, and when you have a better farm, you'll be able to run more stock. And if someone is looking at it from the figures of like, well, does it actually make more money if you do it that way? Well, it won't the first week, maybe, but you look on the long term, it will, because suddenly you've got a better farm that can handle more growth, that can handle more livestock. So the better yeah, you and, manage it. So, And it becomes more resilient. Yeah. And you, you don't have any, any outgoing costs. Like, we, we don't put fertiliser on here. Yes. We don't, we don't put any chemicals on our farm whatsoever. We don't have to drench our sheep. We don't have to drench our cattle. Yeah. You know, you're taking all the costs out of your system that you, you'd be paying some big pharmaceutical brand to, to, be, to be able to do that, running it in, in a conventional method. Yeah. So, so your bottom line actually increases as well as, running ex, as well as the extra production. So it's a win-win on both fronts. And then you're also, you know, vertically, vertically stacking enterprises on top of that. So it, you're just building up, you know, building up your cash flow in a situation where, where nothing, there's no, there's no downside. Yes. Yeah. The only downside is, is it requires more labour. Yeah. You know? But, you know, I'd rather invest in, in, in people and, and time yeah. than I would in, in paying some big company to, to put a, an artificial solution onto my, onto my place. Yeah, which is temporary anyway. It's not like an artificial solution that's sustainable for the... That's you right. put on yeah. once and it's all good for 10 years. It's, as soon as you, no. you put it on once, it's like, yep, it's like an addict. You need to do it again and again to keep it up to speed. Yeah, so. and, and it's a compounding addict. You have to put more on to get the, achieve the same result. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We, we've covered quite a bit... Uh, I hope this has been very helpful to to everyone listening about uh, the principles of cell grazing. I'll put a link to your website there, Roger, to so people can find out more about your, your farming tech techniques and um, also see some photos. You've got some beautiful photos up on your Facebook page and also on your website. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thanks for joining us on Green Grass Egg Farming Podcast. For transcripts and other free resources, please go to greengrasseggfarming.com.